Welcome to the naturalist training on leaf miners, galls, and other creatures on plants. Last month, we hosted a presentation to further your use of iNaturalist. You can find the recording on our YouTube channel. In this presentation, we will explore some of the fascinating and little known creatures that live on plants, galls and leaf miners, and many more. My name is Deb Kramer, and I will be your moderator today. I'm the executive director of Keep Coyote Creek Beautiful. I love nature. Nature is incredible. And I've enjoyed um, being in nature since I was young, but have really gotten to know it better over the past seven years and 65 BioBlitzes since I've been working with Marav on our BioBlitz events. And I look at nature so differently now, thanks to our wonderful docents who come out to these BioBlitz events. Keep Coyote Creek Beautiful is a community-based organization that sees Coyote Creek as a resilient ecosystem for all living things to enjoy. We engage, educate, and encourage people by bringing communities together to take action for, learn about, and play along a healthy Coyote Creek. We host cleanups, bio blitz events, hiking, and nature walks. We provide classroom education and even college projects. BioBlitz Club is led by Marav Von Schack and is a community science organization to encourage people to get outside and learn about nature. Through this group's actions over the nearly past seven years, she's hosted 108 events, but well over 1,400 people have participated and contributed to the growing body of knowledge about nature through iNaturalist. So at this time, I will go ahead and turn it over to Marav von Schack. Welcome, Marav. Thanks, Deb, and hi, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us tonight. I'm really excited about uh, this topic because I think it's just fascinating. And I was telling Deb how difficult it was deciding what to include in this presentation and what to leave out because it's such a huge topic and there's so much to share about it. Um, so yeah, let's just start by sharing my screen. Uh, okay, so tonight we'll talk about different organisms we can find on plants. So let's get started. When we go out hiking and guessing that most of you are local, but there might be some people from uh, outside the area. But when I think about hiking, I mostly think about our area, but this should be somewhat true for other places as well. We have these majestic oaks, okay? There's a valley oak to the right, coast live oak to the left. These trees are so dominant in our landscape and, and they're amazing. Other than just being beautiful trees, there's so much more in there. Um, for example, there are so many different species of other organisms that can be found on these trees. And these are just some of the organisms that we will explore later. I actually want to share a quick video. Let's see if it works. So I found this after a bioblitz recently uh, in one of the parks in San Jose. This is a valley oak and actually a coast live oak mixed in between. So these lobed, uh, leaves. This is the valley oak, Quercus lobata, and this is the coast live oak, okay, with kind of spiky leaves. And when you look at the trees, you often don't see much going on. You might see or hear a few birds because these trees get very thick at some point. Um, but you might not see that much other than that. And you might not be able to see all the diversity. But if you slow down, and stop by the tree and kind of look around and try to see what you can find on the tree. So you might see all these like red little cones and this is different uh, plant galls. So these are plant galls induced by uh, wasps in this case. And there are many other species. Here's a very special one that we discovered just last year. This little green thing here. So yeah, I apologize for this pretty terrible video, but I think it just gives you an idea of like looking at this tree 
And other than just, you know, it's like, oh, it's beautiful. Get closer to the tree. You could shake it. It's one of the things I do when we go on violets is I shake the trees above a tray and see what comes off of it because there are so many different insects and so many other organisms that live on these trees. So let's look at some of them. So many of the examples that I'll give you are from this species, Coast Live Oak. But uh, for some of them, I didn't have the right examples. I used other plants from this area. But let's just first start with introducing our plant, Coast Live Oak. Uh, so this is a distribution map from iNaturalist to the right. And it includes all the observations that many different people uh, made from this region. So you can see it's very common. Uh, it's found along our coast. And according to Calscape, it Coast Live Oak can support up to 270 known species of insects and other animals. They use the flowers, they use the leaves, they use the bark, they use the roots, they use every different part of the plant. Yeah, so over 270 species, I think that's amazing. And they also use it as habitat, just like these uh, deer uh, that will find shade under the tree. Uh, it helps some plants uh, get started. So it's a really important plant. Uh, and when we look closer on our area, in the Bay Area, you can see that it's really common in this area. And we've been documenting it as well and contributing to some of these uh, points on iNaturalist. I guess I should start at the beginning. When I wanted to do this uh, presentation series, I was thinking about naturalists like me that go out uh, hiking and are always, I'm always interested in learning something new. Uh, learning about new species that I can document and observe uh, and think about their interactions with other species. And I think um, this is the whole idea of the presentation here is to think of plants more than what they are, which I mean, I love plants. They're awesome. They make the oxygens that we breathe, but they also support everything else. So there are viruses and bacteria, slime molds, different kinds of fungi, lichens, which are also partly fungi, uh, different plants, insects, spiders, amphibians and reptiles, birds, mammals, and there's so much more. So I didn't get a chance to explore all of them, but this is the beginning, okay? So next time when you go hiking, keep all that in mind. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about plants. Uh, when we look at some of our oaks, they might have mistletoe. So this is a common mistletoe in the area. We mostly see it on valley oak, but uh, often on other plants. Mistletoe is an interesting plant, uh, this mistletoe, because, uh, so it's a parasitic plant. It grows on other plants. It Its root, uh, they don't get all the way to the ground. They actually connect to uh, a branch of the uh, host plant and they get the nutrients and water from uh, the host plant. But you can see that they are green, which is why they're considered a hemiparasite, okay? They make their own photosynthesis, which means that they do uh, create some sugar, but they also get more nutrients and water from the host plant. They're actually considered not that um, harmful to the plant, which I think is really interesting. If you want to learn more about them and on some of the other creatures that interact with oaks, I highly recommend this book. And I'll give you a list of resources at the end. Uh, this is the uh, Secrets of the Oak Woodlands. It has so many interesting facts and stories about many species you can find in the oak woodlands. The plant, oh, and one more thing about the mistletoe. Uh, it's also a really important uh, food resource and habitat for different creatures. So it produces uh, lots of berries uh, in the fall, which are important food resource for birds mostly. So now we have an oak that in addition to producing its own acorns, which are the oak seeds, it also helps producing lots of berries that help migrating birds. And of course the tree doesn't care about the birds or about the mistletoe. The tree is just there, but you know, with evolution and millions of years, this is the outcome, the tree that produces acorn, berries, galls, insects, all these different things. Uh, 
To the right, we have maybe a less favorable plant, the poison oak, which is not actually an oak. Uh, it's just a common name. Uh, it belongs to a different uh, genus and it's not related to oaks. The poison oak is native to our area and it often grows as a vine on uh, different oaks. Sometimes it's difficult to get too close to an oak because it might be covered with poison oak, either as a vine or creeping around the base of the uh, oak. Or sometimes it creates an, its own canopy. It looks like a big bush. This is our poison oak, which is highly allergenic. If this was a bio blitz, I'd warn you not to touch it. But if you do touch it, now uh, some of us have hand sanitizer with us. So you could use that in the field. And then just, you know, wash everything when you get home. But poison oak is also an important plant because it produces its own berries that are food resource for birds like chickadees and mammals like uh, chipmunks. Let's talk about some fungi. This is a huge group with so many different lifestyles, life cycles, so many different kinds of uh, fungi. I'll just give some examples. So here you can see different kind of rust fungi. Uh, which is a family of fungus that uh, can induce galls or conkers or witch's broom on different plants. So, for example, this one top left is on Toyon. It's a really cool uh, gall that our friend Michael Hawk discovered about a year ago. It's a really cool gall. And then this one is on, uh, it's called hollyhock, hollyhock rust on Malva, is this species. Okay, it's a non-native uh, weed, that is cheese weed that is pretty common. And then this one in on coyote brush. So they're found on many different uh, plants. Some of them look like that. They have this orange rusty color. And for some, if you want to see the really pretty ones like this beautiful thing, it, you'll actually have to get very close on the ground, look at little plants and look at under the leaf or above the leaf for these tiny structures. But they're really interesting to watch. And uh, thousands of species worldwide, but very few of them are documented uh, in our area. And I think we just need to know more about them and be aware that they exist so we could go out and document them. And some of them are uh, harmful pathogens for plants, but not all. And an interesting fact that I learned about them is that most of them affect two different host plants in separate stages of their life cycle which I thought was really interesting because some of the insects that I usually study, the gall inducers, they are very specific to one host or very closely related hosts. So I thought that was a really interesting uh, fact. Uh, another group of uh, fungi is the powdery mildew. You might have noticed these. Sometimes they're pretty uh, obvious. They look like white uh, powder covering leaves. Uh, you could have it on some vegetable leaves. You could see that on sycamore trees in our streets, uh, but also on oaks, on docks, on roses. So it's a pretty common thing. Um, it's a somewhat superficial uh, fungi with a superficial mycelium, and they only um, uh, attack the epidermal cells, so the, the outer layer of the leaf. Uh, again, many different species, and I'm sure we need to learn more about this. Uh, the next group is the lichens. So lichens are composite organisms. So they include a fungus and usually either an algae or cyanobacteria that live together as one organism, as one species, which is pretty mind-blowing when you think about it. So they create one species together and they have beautiful colors and shapes like these are some of the species that you could see here they're found on trees and shrubs but also other species are found on rocks and even on the soil so when we document them it's uh, often important to note whether they were found on wood or rock or soil but in any case i recommend when you go out next time and you you're interested in documenting some things or observing biodiversity, try to get closer to the tree bark if you can, or even just a branch, and try to see how many different lichens you can find. Because for example, this little twig here has at least three different species, and I'm definitely not a lichen expert, unfortunately. Uh, but you can see this is 
one species here, the orange ones, I think are one species, but maybe more. And then we have this uh, bushy lichen, which is a different species. So really interesting as well here, if you look at this little twig, it has at least three different species. So the diversity is just incredible. And it's just a matter of like looking closely, using a magnifying glass if you can, to inspect the tree bark. Uh, if you do that, you might find another group, which is the mosses. So moss uh, is a non-vascular plant that often grows on trees and sometimes on shrubs and often on the soil itself. But on many of our trees, you could see uh, moss. During the summer, they look like this photo, but this one, they're kind of gray, um, brownish, but then they change very quickly. So when I went hiking a few times right after it rained, I thought that the forest looked different, that it was really interesting that something changed. It just rained a little bit, but you could immediately see the difference. And it's because of this, uh, the moss. Uh, because as soon as you wet them, and you could do that, which is, you know, watering some moss, some dry moss, you'll see that in just a few seconds, they become bright green, just like these photos to the left and bottom right. They become bright green. And because they cover so many of our trees in, in some nature preserves here, like Alum Rock Park, the entire preserve looked different right after even a very short rain episode because the trees just become green bright green their stems and trunks it's just fascinating and now let's move on to our next group uh bacteria hey, Mara, yeah we had a question from maya oh. she mm -hmm. asked do lichen hurt or parasitize the tree or simply attach great question so uh lichens as far as i know don't hurt a tree at all or the other plants or other things because I mean think about it many of that many species grow on rocks so they probably don't get much from the rocks they might be actually getting some minerals from it but as far as I know they don't hurt the plants they might cover them usually they don't cover the leaves so they don't even interfere with photosynthesis uh, but I'm not sure if someone else has other information I'm, I'm happy to hear that definitely not an expert for that but thank you for the question so another group that I wanted to mention was bacteria. Um, and, you know, when we go out on a bioblitz or just, you know, uh, out documenting things, we often try to get a very diverse group of organisms. And sometimes we think, oh, how can we get bacteria? So there's some plant disease that are actually induced by a bacteria. Like the one on the right is the drippy acorn disease pretty awesome common name, which, you know, kind of makes sense. You see these drippy acorns. So this is one thing. Another one that I just learned recently induces these galls on oleander. So oleander is not native, but these galls are found both here and in the native range. Maybe they were introduced with one of the uh, one of their host plants. But anyway, they make these little galls. Pretty interesting. I don't know much about them, though. Uh, another group is the slime molds, which I really like. And I usually find slime molds on uh, dead wood, so on logs uh, from different kind of uh, uh, trees. But sometimes you'll see them on uh, living trees. And I think the false puffball is one of them, but I'm not entirely sure if this one was a live tree or not. And I was thinking that at the end of this presentation, we could actually create something together. So we can start an iNaturalist project. So I'll explain a little bit about the iNaturalist later, but it's the platform we use to document all our observations. And I was thinking that something we can create out of this presentation is continuing to document what we find on Coast Live Oak. We can create a project for that and uh, we can all use that together. Some more mushrooms, but these, are, were, these were found on Coast Live Oak. Okay, so these are just example for some of the different uh, mushrooms or other fungi uh, that were found on Coast Live Oak, like this awesome lion's mane that I actually saw while driving somewhere. And I noticed that there was this gigantic ball on top of the oak. So we had to stop the car, go back and uh, hike a little bit and check what that thing was. It's a really cool mushroom. 
and and uh, all sorts of other ones that you can find. And sometimes you find all these kind of weird little uh, fungi on leaves. Uh, I just learned that this is possibly the correct identification for these um, beautiful patterns that you often see on coast live oak leaves, either on the tree. So this is a green leaf still on a tree, but often uh, when it's on the ground, okay, after they fall, you might see that. So yeah, it's pretty common. And it's just about a uh, search image. So now that you know it exists, you might see that. And then the other uh, fungi that induce galls, even on oaks, this is on blue oak. And then all sorts of random patterns you see on leaves. And it's like, is this uh, a fungus? It could be. I just don't know. But I'd like to learn more about that. And then uh, these are some more common ones, like live oak, which is broom. Uh, to the left, sudden oak death, which is a non-native uh, disease that attacks our oaks and kills them. And to the right, you can see the crumples that we often see on dying oaks or dead oaks. And yeah, these are three different species that are somewhat common in the area. And now let's talk about insects. So as an entomologist, this is my favorite part, but I do find all of them really interesting because I think they make the experience much richer. Uh, so there are many different kinds of insects that are found on trees and especially on the coast live oak. And as I mentioned, what we do often on our biabilities is take a little plastic tray and just shake the tree above the tray. And it's just amazing what you can find. You can find different spiders, and you can find all sorts of insects, some herbivores that feed on the plant sap or uh, chew on the leaves. Uh, we find a whole range of beetles and true bugs and so many other insects. And some insects that just land there as, you know, a place to stand, like uh, non-biting mages and moths and flies of all kinds. So these are the white flies. White flies are uh, plant parasitic hemipterans. So they are true bugs and they feed on the plant. They don't actually move much. These are the larva in these three photos, okay, here. Um, and they are usually, as far as I remember, they don't move much. They have a sucking mouth part that they attach to the plant and they suck in the um, fluid. On the plant so uh, basically some water some sugars some proteins that they get from the plant and these are three different species that you could easily find on coast live oak sometimes together there are two of them right here and then this photo is pretty cool because you could see the adult white fly and now we know why it's called white fly because it's a tiny white fly they're very very small this is the adult female with her babies these are the eggs that she laid in and they often will make this circle i think it's um, made of wax or something like that maybe to deter some of the predators that might eat these tiny eggs and that's how they do it so it's it's pretty interesting uh, to see and some of the white flies are important agricultural pests next another very important group is uh, moths and butterflies so there are many different species of moths and butterflies that feed on our plants, especially on oaks. And on the plant, you can find different life stages. You could find the eggs because many of these species would lay their eggs right where they want their caterpillars to feed. And then you can find the caterpillars, like the tussock moth here and the oak moth here. Okay, so these are, they look kind of chunky because they are ready to make their uh, chrysalis. Okay, so this is the chrysalis of this species. And then other species like the tussock moth, they create cocoons. So if you're from our area, maybe you've noticed these things. People post them to iNaturalist as anything you can imagine. Uh, fungi, I don't know, different random things because they don't look like much, right? They look like a little blob. And sometimes there are so many of them and 
over time they look even less like something specific just like lots of hairs so when the caterpillar creates its little cocoon uh, it uses these hairs which are um, somewhat irritating to protect itself so basically you have lots of hairy trees and then other moths create leaf miners and we'll talk all about leaf miners soon but this is a very common one um, on coast live oak and then of course you could find adult moths but it's not just these three species that i shared with you uh, according to Cascape, which is an amazing resource um, that i'll share with you there are at least 45 confirmed species that are known to use coast live oak as a host plant so as a food resource for the caterpillars and likely 123 more species and these are just moth and uh, butterflies that use this plant as a uh, food resource for the caterpillars okay but there are many other insects that use it for other things but this is why coast live oak is considered uh, a super host or a keystone plant uh, because it is food for so many different species and there are many more so many more so there are different um predators like this dusky wing um neuropteran that it kind of looks like the white fly we saw but this is actually a little predatory uh insect that feeds on aphids and other small insects um we have the fungus eating beetles that eat some fungus and in this case this is a pretty cool one which is actually a fungus eating a fungus eating beetle so the yellow stuff here is a fungus feeding on the beetle that eats fungus so anyway just to show you the diversity right because we're still talking about coast live oaks and some other plants as well uh, many spiders that are here to eat all these different insects that are attracted to the tree um, so there's so many different spiders and often when we shake the tree we get a wide diversity of spiders we get jumping spiders and we get many different orb weavers like this one this is the six spotted you can see six spots so it's actually called six spotted orb weaver and many many other spiders some have amazing camouflage to the tree itself to the um, twigs and some are actually kind of brightly colored and then ants which is my favorite so i studied ants uh, these are velvety tree ants which are really cool species of ant that is often found on our coast live oaks i actually have them in my front yard on coast live oak these ants um, not only forage on the tree looking for food but they also nest on these trees so in my tree they nest at the uh, base of the tree where there's like a hole apart and they have thousands of workers in there they can nest on a few other uh, trees as well but you often see them on coast live oaks and they feed on different insects they um, collect honeydew which is sweet secretions of aphids from aphids on these trees and there are many other ant species that you could find on trees especially in a coast live oak this is actually the best plant to look for ants in this area uh, and then there's the bar clouse and uh, again many more insects but some of these insects are especially Tomorrow. interesting yes before you move on christine yes. asked how big is the tray you're using when oh, you're okay. shaking for the tree basically as big as i could fit in my <laughs> bag so the beautiful um trays that you could buy or not a tray but like a there's a beautiful thing that kind of looks like a kite that you could buy but it's very big and kind of too big for me i use a tray that is slightly larger than my <laughs> bay nature magazine uh so something that you could fit in your bag obviously if it's bigger you'll get more things other than dropping them on the floor but uh if it's small then you're more likely to carry it with you and then just use a stick and you'll learn it's it's actually a technique it, it does require a little bit of learning but you will learn what to shake and you have to do it many times because if you just do it once or twice you might not find anything but it's a terrific technique to to get to see some of this diversity okay because otherwise they just hide in there under the leaves or uh, on the twigs and we don't really see them unless we stare 
uh, at a tree for a long time and look for movement, but some of them don't move much. So by shaking them, you can get to see more. Moving on to gall wasps. So one of my favorite uh, groups of organisms on these oaks, and especially on trees, but especially on oaks, is the gall wasps. And these are different species found all on coast live oak. And some of them actually are two different generations of the same species. But just to show you the diversity of shapes and colors, and if we look at other oaks, they are even more colorful and pretty. I'll show you in a few slides. Um, and I'll explain what these are in just a couple of slides. But they have baby insects for now. And then we saw all these insects and mushrooms and other things we found on the trees. And these all attract other creatures that would be happy to eat them. So there are lots of different birds that you could find on Coast Live Oak or here on Coast Live Oak. Sometimes you can't actually see them much because it's so dense, but you could hear them and sometimes you could see them. So the jays love eating um, acorns from the trees, but also insects, and you often see them there. Uh, acorn woodpecker would collect the acorns and it might use the trees as granary, as a place to store their acorns. Um, and then other birds, many, many birds would come to these trees to eat insects because there are so many different insects on them. And here in the center, we see this little bush teeth feeding on tiny galls from the flowers of the oak. So you need a really tiny bird to eat tiny galls, but it was really cool to see that on a bioblitz like a year ago, a couple of years ago. And then we have mammals uh, that use our trees, not that many in the middle of the city or at the edge of the city, but still we have squirrels. So we have three different species of tree squirrels. Two of them are non-native, unfortunately, the eastern gray, gray squirrel, which are these two. So it has two different morphs. These gray cute things with the white belly, you might have it in your yard, or a very dark one, uh, black, black all over. So this is actually the same species, uh, non-native. And then we have the fox squirrel, which is also a non-native. Uh, and these are found in the city, and sometimes they can get a little bit into nature preserves. But usually, if you get outside the city, you might uh, be lucky and see the western gray squirrel, which is not as common and pretty shy, uh, but it's beautiful. And this is the squirrel that used to live here, but it was displaced by, by, by these species, that, which are non-native. And then there are other mammals that you might see. Uh, for example, the wood rat. So this is the dusky-footed wood rat, which is a really cool mammal that is rarely seen, but usually you could find their nests. So they build this really huge nest made of uh, twigs and branches and leaves and fry material and stuff. And it looks just like a dry pile of stuff and sometimes actually inside a tree, but it's actually a pretty complex uh, structure. So very interesting and very common. But if you haven't seen these before, just you know, try looking next time you go hiking um, because they're pretty common, but you might overlook them thinking it's just a pile of uh, dry stuff. Uh, and one way to know that it is actually a wood rat nest is that you'll find rodent, uh, feces, cat, um, poop uh, all around it. Um, so that should be around their nest. It's like this... Uh, Brown elongated pellet, um, I don't know, less than an inch long. So now I'd like to uh, focus on two different groups of insects and just tell you a little bit more about them and then uh, we'll move on. So the first one is the plant galls because they're really awesome and we could do easily a whole presentation just about these because I do that. But uh, today I'll just mention a few things because we are here to talk about biodiversity and about the things we found on plants. And galls are just an amazing uh, uh, part of our biodiversity here. So these are some of the colors and shapes that you might see now in the fall in the Bay Area. So fall in the Bay Area is just the best time. Huge tarantulas migrating, uh, plant galls, and pretty great weather. So where are they found? So on oaks, oaks have the highest number of uh, gall inducers. Um, this list is from Russo's book from 2021, um, which I'll share with you at the end. 
and you could see the number of species of gallinaceous on different uh, plants. Um, so willow is pretty great as well, but you could see it's a huge difference than oak. And then uh, cottonwood, crescent bush, rabbit brush, sagebrush, coyote brush, all these different species are really good host plants for different kinds of uh, gall inducing organisms. And if you're just getting started and you would like to learn more about galls, so first you can watch our other uh, presentations, but also you could look for one of these host plants because this is a really good way to go. So you can look for oaks in your area. You could look for willows, cottonwood, um, and uh, there are many more. This, this list is especially for the Western US and it might be, you, you could get a more specific list for your area. So what are goals? Galls are a structured growth of plant tissue uh, that are produced by the plant host in response to a mechanical or chemical stimulation. Uh, they are induced by an adult or larva of insects or mites or by uh, fungi. And the mechanism varies according to plant and gall inducers. And they can be found on different parts of the plants, on the leaves, stems, petiole, branches, buds, flowers, seeds, roots, and fruits. So very diverse uh, and different species could use different parts of the plant or even same species could use different parts of the plant on the different generations because they some of them have spring generation and fall generation and they might look completely different. This is not the end of the biodiversity aspect here because the gall inducer is not alone. It attracts lots of other things because it's such a great uh, food resource. So you might have birds that you try and pick and get a little larva from inside the galls, or you might have parasitic uh, wasps and uh, other inquilines, so closely related species that will lay their eggs into an existing gall and have their larva develop in there. So this is the larva that was probably the one inducing the gall. So this is the one that made a plant, the oak in this case, create this gall. So it lives here in its little chamber. And then there's a different lava that's not supposed to be here. So this one was uh, uh, an egg laid by a different wasp, probably a closely related species that just lives there, you know, somewhat peacefully next to the owner of the gall. It might kill it, it might just leave it alone. But now we have another species and you can see here a whole bunch of wasps that are trying to lay their eggs into existing galls. This big thing is actually one of these galls. Okay, so this is a tiny wasp trying to lay its eggs so that its own larva could either feed on the gall or on the gallinaceae, on the little larva. And now you have even more species. And just check out, these are different kind of wasps. Check out this one with this crazy ovipositor. Ovipositor is the organ that they use to lay their eggs into the gall. Okay, directly on the lava of the gall inducer. So it could feed on that. Pretty cool. Uh, the second group that I want to mention a little bit more is the leaf miners, because I think as much as people don't know much about um, plant galls, I think even fewer people know about leaf miners. And those are everywhere. So leaf miners are basically uh, insects that create a tunnel in plant tissue. It's made by a feeding insect larva and it's visible from the outside. This is from uh, Charlie Eisman's book that came out in 2022 and it has over 1200 pages. This is just for North America. There are so many different species and they're pretty easy to find. I mean, some of them are pretty easy to find if you go out to your yard, if you go for a walk in your neighborhood, you might be able to document a few different species. And because they are so overlooked, you might be able to find new species that nobody's seen before, nobody documented before. It's pretty wild. This, for example, is a, it's called a blotch mine. So this is a leaf blotch miner moth. Okay. It actually has a name that I documented on Shrive Oak just uh, three months ago when we went on a walk with a whole bunch of crazy naturalists that were all about looking for things and documenting things, but nobody took a photo of this thing because it doesn't look like much, right? 
uh, I took a photo, uploaded and wrote down the host plant name. In this case, it's shriv oak, which is a subspecies of a black oak. And Charlie Eisner, who wrote the book, said, oh, this is the first documentation of this species. Um, so it's the first one on iNaturalist. And it really happens pretty often, way more than any other thing that I've documented, that I'll document some pretty random leaf miner, and Charlie would say, oh, this is new to the region, new to California. It's new to science. Can you collect it and see what comes out of it? Because often we can't actually identify them because nobody has reared them before. Charlie has reared so many of these species, but and other people too. But for many others, we just don't know what they are. So we still need to do the basic research, collect the mi the, the mines, uh, let the creature come out, see what it is, document it. Uh, the same with some of the um, goals, by the way. There are many species that are no still unknown. And just to show you some of the diversity, so they don't all look alike. Most of them are not very pretty. These ones I thought were kind of cool. But I, I used to overlook them a little, like I didn't care much about them. But then I documented one or two, and Charlie identified it on natural, I naturally. So I was like, oh, that's cool. Someone cares about them. I'll document more. And then I documented a few more. And just that feedback from Charlie was so awesome because I was like, wow, this is really interesting. And I started learning a bit more about them. I took his class. I have his book. But um, yeah, it's just interesting to learn that this entire world is found there between the two layers of the leaf, okay? Because this is where the lava lives for, um, depending on the species, for part of its life cycle. Uh, so the different groups of insects that uh, create uh, leaf mines, uh, the largest group is the moth, and these are a few different groups, flies, beetles, and so flies. When you try to identify them, it's very difficult. Um, definitely not great at that, but you could use Charlie's book. You look at the lava feeding pattern, okay? So each lava does something a bit different. Uh, the ovid position, which means where did they lay the eggs? Because often, um, so you need to take photos of both sides of the leaf if you would like to identify something like that, because often you will see the egg of the um, insect on one of the sides, and that will help you identify it. The shape and arrangement of frass. So frass is insect poop, basically. This is what we see here in the middle, that black pattern. And you can see that this is where the egg was probably, or this is where the egg hatched and the larva started feeding. And this is their poop. So, you know, all their poop is right here. But anyway, they create this cool pattern. And then some of them will make their pupa inside the leaf right there in that little space, and some will come out and make it somewhere else. Uh, but that help, helps us as well identify them. So yeah, different things. And then just to show you the leaf, uh, so the, the leaf structure, leaf miners are found on different parts of the plant, usually on the leaves, but they could also be found on stems, fruits, and flowers, which of course is not great for agriculture, but when you know, you're just looking at biodiversity, it's pretty amazing. So when we try and identify them, one of the things we need to look at is like, how deep is the mine? Because some of them would only use the upper layer of the leaf, the epidermis, and like this one, uh, and others might use uh, different parts of the mesophyll, the inside, okay? And this is something you can see when you look at the leaf. So you see there's so much to learn. And then the shape of the mine itself. So in general, we have, uh, linear mines like this one, which is like a linear line, and then uh, blotch mines, which create this big uh, area. Yeah, but then there are a few other options. So this is just to give you a taste of what are leaf miners, because I really think that most people don't know that they exist, and people that know that exist don't know much about them. Why should we care? I mean, about all these little things. And the big things as well. So we are facing the insect apocalypse. Um, and this is a, an amazing uh, quote by E.O. Wilson from some years ago. If all mankind were to disappear, the world would regenerate back to the rich state of equilibrium that existed 10,000 years ago. 
If insects were to vanish, the environment would collapse into chaos. We need the insects. We just, we cannot exist without them. The plants need the insects. The insects need the plants. We need both. 90% of the insect herbivores, so insects that feed on plants, are diet specialists, which means that they eat only one or very few uh, plant species and then depend on having these plants around. So by uh, removing all the food, we are losing our insects. By planting non-native trees everywhere, uh, we are losing our bird populations, which cannot nest in the city during the spring. Uh, Doug Talamey, who I quoted here, did amazing studies about the number of caterpillars birds need in order to nest, to successfully raise their little chicks. They need thousands of caterpillars. They actually quantify that. These caterpillars need to come from somewhere, uh, from our native plants, because it's not enough to feed birds. I mean, they enjoy the seeds, but they need insects. They need the protein, especially when they rear their young. So we need to think about that when we plant our plants in our yard or in our cities or in a campus. We need to plant more ecologically productive plants, not just any plant or something exotic that looks beautiful. Because if a plant is not from here, then it didn't evolve here with all these different insects. Our native plants evolved here for millions of years and different kind of insects and other organisms evolved to feed on them, even though they try hard to get rid of all these different insects, but they co-evolved with them so that many different species that can feed on them. And not all plants are equal. So I mentioned that we have keystone plants uh, or uh, super hosts that are host species for more uh, insects than other plants. So it's good to have a wide diversity, but it's also important to have these keystone uh, species. And when we do our bio blitzes, we go to different parks in San Jose. So I uh, host lots of events with Deb and Keep Coyote Creek Beautiful, where we work along Coyote Creek that you could see here in the map. And we go to different parks. And I'm always amazed by the high diversity of species we can find, even in the middle of San Jose, a busy city with 1 million people living here. There are still so many insects and so many birds and so many plants and so many things we see. And of course, there are, there's a lot of disturbance and pollution and many things. But because we have so many native oaks and so many native species along the creek, they support this uh, rich diversity of insects that in turn support our birds and our other species. Uh, so yeah, I wanna go back to this photo that I shared with you earlier with all the different species you can find on trees. So think about them. Next time you see a coast live oak and you're like, hmm, that's not a very pretty tree, but it's not alone. It has all these other creatures that are part of its landscape. Uh, and yeah, this is just that list that I shared. So just briefly, I want to share a little bit of information about documentation. So if you're interested, like me, in documenting what you see, uh, either for your own uh, knowledge and learning, or just if because you want to share that knowledge and add information to iNaturalist, for example, that has an incredible database, so you could add your observations into different projects like goals of North, North America, or leaf miners of North America, then they're more likely to be seen by experts like Charlie and other people that might help you identify them. We have Gull Week events. We already had four different events where people go out for a whole week and document goals from different parts of the world. And just a few tips. So always write the host plant. Okay, if you don't know what it is, you can document it and link that. You can add that to different projects. You could add annotations if it's a goal. And then you could add the host plants because that makes it so much easier to find it later. And again, I would create um, a project for all of us to use. So it would be wonderful if you join that project, if you contribute observations of things you find on Post Live Oak. Let's just start with that. So what else can you do? 
it's a long list, but just start with one, plant natives. Um, Doug Talame, which I'll share his information with you later, has these wonderful presentations where he uh, recommends and you know, emphasize how important it is to plant natives. If you have some land, you know, plant natives. If you have a little yard, even in the middle of the city, plant natives. If you have a porch, plant some natives in a little pot. That would be great too, because we really need these plants. You can create pollinator gardens. Let's say you already have a beautiful yard with beautiful flowers and vegetables and everything else. You could attract more pollinators and natural predators to live in your yard by planting natives. Uh, and then there's some general tips like leave the leaves, uh, don't mow, reduce the lawn, leave some exposed soil, uh, don't use pesticides and fertilizer, reduce the light, uh, remove invasive species, add logs, lots of different things that you could you, you do in order to increase the diversity in your own yard and in your area. And then advocate for parks and preserves. We really need help with that. Wherever you live, I'm sure you could find uh, a local group that would love to get some help in advocating for our parks, preserves, and even just notice what kind of plants does your city plant? Do they plant natives? Do they plant enough natives? Think about that and see what you can do. And of course, join us for BioBlitz. So if you're local, please join one of our events on my website, BioBlitz Club. You can find some resources, some presentations, all our previous presentations as well, um, and future events. And I do hope to see you on some future presentations and future events. So we have a huge list of ideas of things we'd like to do uh, for future presentations. Uh, and we will send you information about that. Uh, these are some of the resources that we will send to you um, in a couple of days. OK, so let's stop sharing so we could see each other and get some Q&A. So at this point, if anyone would like to um, ask a question, you can uh, just go ahead and raise your hand and I will uh, invite you to speak. Or if you have a comment or you'd like to share an experience. Yeah, what's your favorite thing to, that you find on plants? Oh, what's your favorite native plant? Alex. Maybe you have some stories from your yard. Yes, I do. Alex, uh, go so, ahead. Yeah, uh, what's uh, what's the uh, project that we're going to create is going to be on? Like, is it going to be on goals or? So I'd like to create a project for everything that we find on Coast Live Oaks, because for this presentation, I was looking for that information. I was looking for all the different species that I observed on Coast Live Oak, and it was really difficult to get them out of iNaturalist. And it doesn't need to be new observations. If you remember that you saw that thing on specifically on Coast Live Oak, you can add old observations, like all the goals that you already know what they were on. You could add those. But if you saw a bird like that J I saw, now I'm not sure which trade was on but next time I'll see one and it will be on Coast Live Oak, I'll be like, okay, that goes into that project. And the way the project would work is that it will be a manual uh, project. Uh, so oh, maybe I'll, I'll, I'll go back two steps because I'm sure some people here never used iNaturalist before. So it's this uh, free smartphone app that you could just download, create a username and password, and you could use it wherever you go. You could take photos and upload them and we'll use AI and try and guess what you found. But you could also use it to upload photos that you took a week ago, five years ago, whatever, as long as you know approximately where it was and when it was, you could upload it there. On iNaturalist, there are different projects, which is a way to categorize uh, observations according to different things. Could be goals, leaf miners, um, beetles of California, you know, there are many different projects and some of them are really interesting. Uh, so this project would be manual project, which means that you'll have to join the project and then add your observations manually. So choose that project from a list of projects, and then you could add that to the project itself. And if it's not clear, you can always email me. We'll, I'll share my information with you in a couple of days. So. 
um, you can always reach out on iNaturalist or send me an email. So what did you decide to name? Go ahead. Uh, hi, um, I just actually finished a course. I just got certified as an uh, uh, interpretation guide. And so <clears throat> I had my presentation today and what I ended up doing was um, I did some oak woodlands. I was talking about how important they were and uh, I did oak gall ink. So I actually made the oak gall ink just to try to reach people in whatever different way. But um, so when I saw that you were presenting, I just saw this kind of last minute. I was kind of, yeah, I was geeking out. So I'm very excited to have uh, been able to see this and it was just very timely. And when I was collecting the, um, some of the, specimens, you know, just cutting some branches and being able to show them at this presentation. And the galls, I must have counted probably four or five different types. And it was just really exciting. So um, thank you so much for all of your passion and information. And um, I'm just, I'm inspired to do more. That's wonderful. Yeah, yeah, thanks for sharing. Hey, Marava, um, there's a question. Would you show the book you have about the oak woodland, please? Yes. And again, I will share all these resources with you, but I'm happy to show it right now. So this is Secrets of uh, the Oak Woodland Woodlands. Enrique, it's you have beautiful. a question. It's, it's kind of stories about different species. It's wonderful. Go ahead, Enrique. Yes, thank you. Uh, I'm in San Diego, and uh, welcome. Well, yeah. yeah. Well, we we heard about it from the Natural History Museum, so I wanted to be on this presentation. And we hike a lot in the mountains and in the desert. And I noticed that in some, uh, especially in scrub oak, but maybe in a lot of different plants, that you will see some plants a, a shrub next to uh, another one that one has a lot of little galls. And the other one will not have any or have very few. Can you talk about that? Yeah, and I think that's fascinating. I always find that puzzling. So first, I don't have an answer. I really don't know. But I did notice that many times that one tree, so I look at you know three different valley oaks, all the same species. One is covered with red cones. They're so obvious. You, know, you see them easily. And then the one next to it has a few or none. And then it might have a whole bunch of other species. Uh, and then the third tree could have a different combination of species. It's really interesting. And I wonder why that is, you know, it could be that some of these trees were planted and then we don't know where they got the plants from. Maybe they're from different populations. So some are less palatable for the insects, um, which is a really important topic. Like where do we get our trees from if we plant natives? Where do we get them from? They need to be as local as possible, right? But that's not always easy. Um, you know, one, yeah. one, uh, one, I don't know if it's a myth or not that I've heard that that some wasps can tell by their ovipositor if the plant will be a, a plant that will make a good gall, a thick gall, as opposed to a thin gall? Is there, you know, and, mm. and I can, I'll just send that out to the group. Is there any truth in that? I don't know, maybe. I haven't heard that one, but it it could be. I mean, it's it's such a wide topic. Again, I have whole presentations just about galls, but I still don't know the answer to that question. And maybe someone else does. There are some studies done, many studies done about galls, but still many different things we just don't know. Uh, we have another question from Teresa. Yeah, I was actually um, wondering, just kind of considering the uh, promiscuity of oak trees and uh, how there's so many hybrids. And if there are some that are very uh, host specific, has anyone done a study around hybrids and how hybrids may have some relation to that? Yeah. Uh, okay, another great question. So with hybrids, so it's correct, right? Especially like here, you could see 
uh, valley oak and blue oak, it's very often difficult to tell which one is which because it's more like a continuum, I think, from valley to blue oak because they hybridize so much. So often you'll see leaves that look like something in between. Uh, so these species are obviously closely related. They're both white oaks and they can share some of the gold species. So if you look at valley oak, it has a whole bunch of different species of uh, wasp galls. And then blue oak has some of these species, not all of them, but many of these species, and then some other species that you don't usually see on uh, valley oak. So they each have their own species and they share some. And then um, it's a good question, like how different these hybrids are from one another. And if some of them can't have any galls or the insects can't induce any galls on them and some can be used as a blue or as a valley. Uh, yeah, another good question. Wow, but I, I, I can say cool. that sometimes it's not clear, even for botanists, like which oak they're looking at, because some scrub oaks, for example, could really look like a coast live oak and the other way around. And uh, so it's not really about hybrids, but galls could be really useful for that because these oaks belong to two different groups of uh, oaks. So they don't actually share galls. If you see galls on something that looks like either a scrub oak or coast live oak, but they're too similar to one another, then looking at the galls could be really useful because that could solve your mystery. Yeah, cool. Hey, Thank you. If, uh, if everybody would like to turn their camera on, we can see your bright and shiny faces. Uh, Gary, you've got a question. Comment. The uh, Oakland book is uh, online. You can buy it and get it from uh, San Jose or Santa Clara Valley uh, County Library. It's a digital. That's cool. Thanks for sharing that, Gary. OK, someone is asking a question about sycamore trees. So sycamore trees also have some interesting diversity of organisms, probably more than what I see, but I see, well, the mildew uh, fungus that I shared with you, but sometimes you'll see different beetles on them and especially lace bugs. So lace bugs are these beautiful true bugs. They have their wings look like lace with many tiny, tiny cells. If you magnify them, they just look fantastic. So those are often found under the leaf of a sycamore tree. Um, check that out next time you see a sycamore. It's, it's seasonal, but I'm not entirely sure what would be the best season, which is another thing you can check on iNaturalist. When are they seen? Because um, I don't remember. And yeah, and I'm sure there are many other organisms found in sycamore because it's a pretty good tree. Rob, there's a question that Coulter asked. Coulter. Coulter. Yes, hi. Um, so brightly colored. Yeah, another great question. I love it that, you know, I, I learned so much about goals and, and there's still so much I don't know. I just love that. So I'm not sure why they're brightly colored. I think. They don't want to be eaten by different uh, browsers, different animals that eat the leaves. They don't taste good, so the animals wouldn't want to eat them unless it's like a specific um, animal that actually is trying to get the lava from the inside. But the gall itself is uh, pretty bad to eat. It has lots of tannins. It's very rich with tannins, so it's uh, very bitter, um, possibly poisonous. So animals wouldn't want to eat it. And I think by being so colorful, that might help them. I'm not sure though. If you think about the animal that eats that, those leaves, it might not help that much. So I'm not sure. How about, does anybody have a favorite gall that they want to share that they discover? Just one? <laughs> so we can start with one. Oh, children's books about galls. That's such an awesome idea. I don't know. Um, but I wanted to share the, the gold book with you, which is this one by Rusa. So this is the newer one from 2021 um, for the Western coast. It's a wonderful book. And again, I will share this with you guys, um, but highly recommended. 
Yes, yeah, someone want to test, taste the goals. Good luck, Coulter. Let me know what you thought about that. Um, this is another highly recommended book. Terrific for a topic. So different things you like different uh, tracks and signs made by insects and other arthropods by Charlie Eisenman and um, Noah Cherney. Yeah, these are the books I have on my table. And then I was listening to some books. So I'll show those as well. Um, and then some podcasts. So next week, there'll be a new podcast uh, by it's actually a new episode by, on a new podcast by our friend Michael Hawk jumpstart nature so that's the new uh, podcast and it's right on spot on our topic of why it's so important to plant natives and how many species they um support and why it's so interesting and so important so i will i will share that as well yeah there was one on the um yeah inducing. who's inducing yes mm -hmm. okay so i could partially answer that question because again, this is this is a complex topic, but um, there are different groups of gall inducers, right? I mostly spoke about the wasps on the oaks, but then on other plants, there are many other groups of insects and even other organisms that would induce galls. So, for example, um, there are different kind of wasps. There are um, aphids. There are midges, which are kind of fly, and in each group, the mechanism could be different. So in some of them, uh, it's by the female laying the egg. For example, in if you've seen the bright red galls on willows, willow apple gall, those are very common. Here, it's induced by the female uh, that lays the eggs on the willow uh, plant. Mm -hmm. uh, and we know that because if something happens to the larva, so again, the female lays the egg, the plant creates the gall, and then the larva is supposed to uh, grow inside and feed on the inside of the gall. But if something happens to that larva, the gall would be formed anyway, because it would be formed regardless of what's happening with the larva, because it was the female who induced that, or the laying the egg. And the exact mechanism is not clear, or at least not to me. Uh, it's often uh, something mechanical, with maybe chewing or something like that, uh, and also chemical with different compounds that the insect could um, inject into the plant. So this is a soul fly, okay, the one on uh, willow. But then another, uh, like when we talk about gall wasps, for example, it's actually the lava that induces the gall. So if something happens to that lava, let's say they have that um, parasite or inquilin that join them in the gall, it will change the way the gall would look like because either the lava died, the original lava is maybe now dead, or because there's someone else in there and you know they kind of take some space. So the gall might look a bit weird, kind of deformed. Um, okay, so hopefully that answered some of that. Live oak apple galls, those are really awesome. And they have two different generations. So there's the spring generation, which is slightly colorful and, and really cute, like little mushrooms under the leaf. And then there's the fall generation now is like a green apple, not as big as the ones on valley oak, but starts kind of green and then it will become brown wooden gall. Oh, what's that? It's a gall hat. Which gall is that, Emma? A big, big twig. Big twig, yes. <laughs> Very nice. Emma's I love it. Really, <laughs> really into galls. Yeah, that's yes. pretty awesome. <laughs> yeah, little rosette galls are really cool and very common. Once you learn how to identify some of these species, you realize that they're pretty common. Yeah, and the crystal and gall wasp is amazing. It looks like this big, fluffy, uh, pink stuff under the leaf of usually um, blue oak, but other species as well. And some some trees actually have a lot of that. So they look like they're covered with cotton candy. It's pretty cool. And I think uh, this is a startup, Marianne, uh, to write a children's book about goals. That's a terrific idea. So someone will have to get that started. I'm happy to contribute all my photos.
Yeah, but really, this is a wonderful time to go out and look for all these different things. Because if you go out now, there's so many different goals on our oaks. And then you could already see some of these parasitic wasps uh, trying to get their eggs in there as well. Um, you could always find different leaf miners. Um, I'm sure some of them are seasonal, but some of them are not. Um, and soon we'll have some mushrooms and some other things on our oaks hopefully but even now there's like so much to see and if you go in the evening you might see a tarantula which would be very exciting so a big thank you to Marav for sharing your knowledge with us thank you thank you I also want to thank you for joining this naturalist training and that we hope you got a good taste of how to look for and know what those funny creatures are that are on plants uh, we're developing additional training events and plan to host more on topics such as iNaturalist projects, fungi and slime mold, and how to host a bio blitz. And of course, we hope that you'll join one of our bio blitzes. We'll have a recording of this video within a couple of days and send you a link in the follow-up email, as, long, as well as the list of resources that Marav has said um, she's got handy there. And in the meantime, you can find additional videos of virtual bio blitzes on our YouTube channel, which I put in the chat. So again, thank you for attending this webinar. Can I say one last thing? Yes, of course. Sorry, sorry, yeah. Um, so when you, when you go to a lot of places and you're looking at the oak trees and stuff, you go through parks and things and uh, um, you, know, you, get, you get the lower branches of the trees. And, uh, but if you go to somewhere where there, maybe there's a creek nearby, uh, I think I'm thinking like Los Gatos Creek Trail, right? You go along and there's trees at different levels between where the trail is and where the creek is. So that allows you to get to different heights into the tree because they grow up by the trail. And you might see thing, different things there than you would see normally in the lower part of a tree. So just kind of kind of look at, at different locations and it lets you look at whatever trees are there. So you may see stuff that uh, hasn't been discussed here or, or uh, you know, you'll see new exciting stuff to bring to next time's uh, meeting. Right? Yeah, no, you're totally right. Like I remember uh, doing the same thing with uh, a bridge uh, in Kelly Park where I was able to see the top of, in that case, it was a cottonwood tree, but I noticed that it had far more goals than you could reach from um, the ground, basically, because I think those goals actually prefer the top or like higher parts of a tree. So, and I think some other species might have preference. So yeah, we could find cool stuff that way. And also actually getting under the tree, you might see different things than if you're just looking uh, from the outside, because you're looking under the leaves, you might see a whole bunch of things you've never seen before.